So good afternoon. We are conducting an oral history today with Dr. Frida Sattel and we're going to ask some questions and we'd like you to just tell us a little bit about your life, your experiences, uh, being in Johnstown, being part of the synagogue's family. So anywhere you would like to begin, you can begin. Yes, I was born and raised here in the old, I was born in the old Lee Hospital and my life has always been in Johnstown. Uh, as far as relationship with the synagogue, at one time there was a synagogue across from the railroad station. Do you remember where that was? Yes. And at an early age, I think it was about eight, I went to Hebrew school. I walked to the, I was eight years old. This is what happened today. I walked to the incline and in the big room by the incline, there was a rack on the wall that you had a ticket to go down, all the families. And you went, you got your ticket, and they punched it, you went down. And I, then I went to Hebrew school. And Rabbi Simon, who became very well known, and he was the rabbi. And I think I started with him. So I was involved in the synagogue at a very early age. And there was something to remember too. Next door was the Jewish we don't have anymore. Um, it, it, they, it had a butcher shop. And I think many of us had free bees going next door. Of course, there was no bat mitzvah, but many years later, um, five of us had a bat mitzvah. But at that time, so like I said early on, I was evolved. And there were many things that I did that, let alone girls, I don't think if you had a little boy that that would do. At an early age, I went by myself to Baltimore. There was a B&O train at that time. That's where my grandparents lived. But I went for myself. I was given independence, if you will, but nobody thought of bad things happening. You never would let that happen today. Your parents must have trusted you. Right. It, it's... And... At an early age, I was investigating. I wanted to know. Where did you go to high school? Westmont High School. Um, it was like a private school. And I think at that time, we were, were the top school. I'm going back, 1925. I'm going to be 103. So, when, first there was, of course, the grade school that is no more. And 
At that time, we lived on Edgehill Hill, Edge Hill Drive, and it was a double house. The landlord was on the left, and we were on the right. And then right by that was a big driveway that went from Edgehill Drive to Bucknell, where the school was. So again, at the age of four, I saw these children going up the driveway. So I, got, I was on the porch of where I lived, and I went down and I followed the children to the school. And I saw a fire escape. And I went up the fire escape and through a window. And I could still see Miss Murphy, who had red hair. I could still see her and a bum leg. And she looked at me when I came in. She said, don't belong here, you belong in kindergarten. So she took me by the hand and took me down to the kindergarten. Of course, the kindergarten teacher never saw me, never knew me. Finally, they asked who I was. I didn't know who I was, because sometimes children of that age don't know who their last name. But at any rate, that was one of the many times that my mother gave me a spanking. <laughs> So things like that happened, like I said, as an early age, investigating and knowing. And Westmont was a wonderful school. I think we're one of the top. And years later, when I was going to college, it was the school of optometry. At that time, now I'm, I'm up to 1939. And where did you go to college? Pennsylvania College of Optometry, PCO. Because way back then, if you had the necessary credits, you could go from high school. Although most people in that class were, many of them, were people who were not able to get into med school. But it, you had to have certain credits. So how did I decide to do that? When I graduated from high school, which was 1939, we talked about, and it was right after the Depression. Mm. So about going to school. So I said, how about Penn State? He said, well, I think we can manage that. And I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a journalist. And my dad said, be a writer, a journalist. You probably could get a job at the Tribune for $10 a week. He said, but there are other things. What about optometry? So we, well, we'll look into that. Okay, he said, when you go to college, you have, that should be your insurance policy. That's good to take care of you for the rest of your life. Working for the Tribune at ten dollars a week is not really the best idea. A nurse, teacher, even optometry. Okay, we'll look into that. Well, there were certain courses that you had to have, but you could go from high school. Not anymore, but back then, yes. So. I had a tutor, um, physics and chemistry. And I had a, had that background, and I did that, and I was accepted. And 
in those days, if a girl, there was nothing for the dormitory because there weren't that many. So we lived on the third floor, if you will, of the dean's house, but it was huge. It was a mansion. And How my, many other women were in your class? Uh, hmm? How many other women were in your class? We started off with seven and ended up with five. And the third floor, uh, there's, I think there were three seniors. And that was something else too, living at the Dean's house. And you had hours, you couldn't, oh, and they told the girls they couldn't date now that was foolish. You couldn't date. You could go to dances and so forth. But of course everybody did. And when I graduated, I did okay at school too. And when I graduated, I went up to practice with my dad, who had a place on Market Street, the corner of Market and Lincoln. Was your dad also an optometrist? Well, that's why, yes. Okay. Yeah. There weren't that many. And I worked with him. And then I got interested in something called visual therapy of a child who had amblyopia, not seeing well with one eye, or other things. At any rate, there was a course, I got interested in that at State College. There was a professor, and a, both an, a professor and another optometrist teaching the course. And I got very interested in that. And I went to the Gazelle Institute, which is part of Yale. And there's a picture of me, I'll show you later, the only girl, the only, fe only female at this point in the class. Anyway, my, I was with my dad for, for some years, but when my dad was <clears throat> 58 years old, he died. So I took over the practice. And there was a sales rep who told me this. The third month of my practice, he went back to his boss. And he said, she's not going to make it. I was young, I was female. But there were those who did have faith in me. That they, and I did things like if somebody, there, there was a um, optical place on at that time on Main Street, and um, that I dealt with. At any rate, this man went, came in and had an accident that was not Johnstown, and um, he came in, and then he brought his children, and I said, who referred you? And he said, no one. But seeing a female, female, if you could get through school doing this, I thought you ought to, you ought to be pretty good. And he had five children, it was wonderful. <laughs> so I did that. And then I became involved in many other things. And one of the, one of the things, there's a box 
on the table. You can read that. No. Oh, I see what you're doing. In grateful appreciation to Frida Sedell, OD, 50 years of loyal and faithful service. The American Optometric Association, January 1995. Time marched on. So, I belong to the International Optic Ophthalmological League. It's from all over the kind of all over the world. And by that you could travel and it was tax deductible. So I've seen most of the world. The first one, the first one was Denmark. But the places I've been besides that, I was on an African safari. In those days, we lived in tents. There was, now they have buildings that look like tents. And there was something called treetops. If you can imagine something like railroad cars connected in trees. Is built, and you went there, you, and you like the bunks in a sleeper, and then you hear them say, "Elephant, elephant," and you ran out and you looked down, and you saw the elephant, and so forth. So that was that, and then, like I said. Travel became something that I was very interested in. And later I'll show you the places. So, travel was something that I loved to do from the very beginning on my own. I was married, but had a divorce. But we traveled some then, but then later on when I was on my own, <clears throat> through the league and through other things, travel was something that I was very interested in. I went to Egypt by myself, no tour. I went to China, but that was the year the Second World War was 19... 45. 45. This was after the war. Oh. 1952. Something like that. That I went with a group. There was a, I got the, I had COVID. And when you're under pressure, you heard a brain fog? Mm -hmm. I may not be able to come up with the words. A manual. Every, not a manual, but a pamphlet, if you will, every month talking about what's going on in the optometric world. And I'm reading, and I see that the Dean of Berkeley the Optometric School was having a, sponsoring a trip that he had made possible to go to China and go to the hospitals and discuss there some of the things that are being done here. 
So I thought, oh, China, that sounds very interesting. So I called up and I said, his name was Dr. Dr. Carter. And as I was reading about your trip, is this just for Berkeley? He said, no, it's open. I said, would you send me the information? So he did. The more I thought about it, I thought, that sounds pretty good. So I said that I was going. I belonged in Johnstown to something called the Seroptimus Club. As a matter of fact, I was president one year. So there was a, when I went to the, one of the meetings, there was somebody there who said, that I was told by Goyd. She said, that sounds wonderful. I would, that would be wonderful. I said, would you like to go with me? So she did. And we, but to get there, That was the other one. That was the thing to get there. And of course, the, the trip was was wonderful. And there was another trip because of Dr. Carr. He was going to Japan. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. That's from Japan. Oh. And. I said about, about, I went to the, the three A's, Richard Klemek. They had a, does that name mean anything to you? No. Anyway, the three A's, he worked with the travels. Mm -hmm. And we had many, as a matter of fact, I just heard from him not too long ago. But at any rate, he took care of all, all of the trips we had and made other arrangements and whatnot. So, we're getting everything ready. And, like I said, the dean at Berkeley, and he said, when I about going, I told him, that uh, I had made arrangements for Aaron Howe, and it so happened that he was going on the same plane from California that I was. He said, my, one of the professors is going with him, but he said, how about you give the professor your ticket and you can sit with me? I said, oh, that would be wonderful. He said, okay. He said, I'll meet you at the airport. And I said, well, how will I know you? He said, well, I'm middle-aged and slightly bald. I said, there may be more than a few slightly bald. But I said, but you wear a red carnation. He says, yes. So I'm at the airport waiting, and I look at this character coming. Do you know the... the what the clowns wear. Mm -hmm. Well, this person was wearing that. So that, anyway, I met him, and but was with him a lot on the on the trip. And one time, they were giving lectures, and I decided, I. Came here or well, not? I need to see something else. So you were marked if you. And so I was getting ready to get off the bus that took us to the from the hotel. And somebody said, "Where are you going?" And I said, "Well, I want to see something else." He said, "You miss a lecture." 
you're going to lose the credit. Mm. I looked at him, he said, I'm not kidding. So, of course, I got back on. But I did. They did have some free time. So, I wanted to buy something in Japan. It was in, this was in Kyoto. So, I went down to the concierge. I wanted, he wrote down what the bus number. And he wrote down a street that I should go to. So, okay, I'll do it. So, I looked for the bus number, get on the bus, and the bus driver told me where to get off. And of course, all the signs are in Chinese, right? So I'm standing there looking, I'm thinking, okay, now what? Young man comes up to me. I might even have a picture. Anyway, comes up to me, says, I can help you. I said, yes. And I said, told him where I wanted to go. him where I wanted to go. And I take you there. I said, oh, that's great. So we're walking, and I went into the shop. I wanted to buy china, not the sets, but things for mementos or to give whatever. So he took me there, but he stayed with me to interpret. And then it, when he showed me a certain piece of glass or whatever. No, 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 that one, that one. So after having that, and he said to me, he saw, saw the list. I take you there. Um, okay. So he said, I'll meet you out front. I'll bring the car, and he takes the takes the packages, and off he goes. And I'm thinking, maybe that wasn't so smart. But anyway, he does come back with the packages, and I could get in the car. And we he starts showing me some of the places, and then we got out of the car and walked. As we walked past one place, it was a um, shop, and in the window, the bakery. It had my favorite cake, a strawberry shortcake. We were going by, and I look in, and I said, oh my god, a strawberry shortcake. And he thought, well, yeah. I said, that's my favorite cake. Anyway, so we're walking. But he said, I have to get something out of the car. And he goes back, I waited. So now we go other places. We went to a place where they were blessing a car. And then at the very end, he took me to a place, a tower, where you take an elevator to the top. And then a panorama. You could see all of Kyoto. When I'm thinking about it, it was fantastic. And we go back in the car because it, there was that was going to be the last. We, we all ate together, the group. That was going to be the, our last evening, there were speeches and whatnot. So we, I told him, I said, I have to get back. Now I must go back. When it was time to go, 
he handed me a package. What was it? Strawberry shortcake. When he went back to the car to get something, that's what he got. <laughs> Trusting is right. I'm gonna go, I can go ramble back and forth, right? Yes. I'll tell you how trusting. When I was going to college in Philadelphia, so the, the dormitory, remember, mm -hmm. was the, the attic, was, and there was the Elkins Park. So to get to the city of, into Philadelphia, you had to go to the subway, where, the, where you could take, you took a bus to the subway, and then you went into Philadelphia. So I'm standing on a corner, waiting for the bus. And the car comes by and said, can I help you? Where are you going? I said, I I'm going to the subway station. I'll take you there. Oh, okay. So I get in the car. Get in the car, close the door. He start yelling at me. You never should do this. He said, where are you from? And I said, Johnstown. He wasn't quite sure even where that was. But he gave me, he said, don't you ever do this again. He said, that now I'm going to ramble. A little out of ramble? Yes, go right ahead. Many years later, many years later, I'm in Egypt, and by myself, not a tour. So, staying at the hotel, but I want to see the Sphinx. I want to see some other things. So, I think I'll go on a tour. But I had time to waste. So, I find out that in that area of where the Sphinx and so forth, the Minna House, oh my God, I remember, which was one of the finest hotels in the world in Cairo. Oh, I think I'll go out to the Minna House and I can have dinner there and then go on the tour. Okay, that's a good idea. So, meanwhile I was in, so, I went, and like I said, and went to the Minna House, and we had to wait. And I'm looking out the window, and there's what the burial place, the dome. Can't think of the word. Pyramid. Anyway, looking at that. But I'll have other things to do. Let's just see. So, so there's a place where there was a perfumery mm. in the middle house. So I went in and I'm looking at the perfumes. And the gentleman, very distinguished, can I help you? I said, well, I'm just looking around because I'm waiting to take the tour out to the Sphinx. And he said, would you like to see the factory where this is made? Okay, I'll go see the factory. I know the factory was around the corner. Okay, that's fine. So, I'm going to close the shop. I'm going to bring the car and meet you out the front. Okay, I thought it was around the corner. 
So, I get in the car and we're driving. But I'm looking out the window. There are camels, there are the Bedouins, and we're driving. And I see more. I'm thinking, where in God's name am I going? Hmm, I'm too old to be in a harem. What else? What else? What else? And we're driving. And we come to something, if you can think of something like a circus tent, it's huge. Okay, so we get out there. And I get out of the car with him. I'm thinking, oh my God. So I go in this place. No females, don't say they were all men. And I go in to this, I didn't know where I was going, but it wasn't a display of perfumes. And this one, and that one, and so forth. And then this person came up, and didn't speak English, but he was the man who took me. Here's telling me what the other man said. He's interpreting. And he said, ask me different questions. And now this other man said, just the perfume. So he gets, he, he, he goes over to one place and I had to pick out a bottle. I thought, oh my God. Oh my God. I thought I'd pick out a bottle. The perfume is being made just for me. This is going to cost a fortune. So I said, I picked out a bottle and I said, But just give me a sample, and if I really like it, I'll come in the shop tomorrow. Because I'm staying there. And then, oh, oh, so I said, just give me a little bit. Now, a lot of it has gone. Oh my God, it's wonderful. Is it is wonderful. That is amazing. And what year would this have been? Well, I was too old to be in a hair. I guess it was in my 60s. That's amazing that that has kept that scent that long. It's incredible. Is that wonderful? That is the, that is the sweetest smell. No, I have not used it as perfume. A little by little it's going, but the scent is there. I don't know what this cost me, but I th at least I, I got out of it. Here, I'll set it over here. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's... And of course, then I did get back to the hotel, and I did go on the tour, which was phenomenal. Ramsey's statues. Tell me a little bit about how you met your husband. That's another story. Were you told about that? No, no. Oh, mm -hmm. You should ask. Okay, I'm at college. And I'm at the college and instead of taking the bus home, I'll walk. To walk it would take about a half an hour, but I'd done it before. So I'm walking and I get up to the place to get the bus and it's starting to rain. And I think, oh my God. I didn't expect this. 
So I, I went in and looked at, there was a place there, right where I was standing, in back of me. I saw people in the, in the building with a floor, and they're playing chess. So I go in, and I said, they looked at me. There were, the area was about three times this size, but the, this wide. They're sitting down with chess boards. And I said, they looked at me and I said, is it okay if I wait here for the bus? It's starting to rain. Certainly. Do you know how to play chess? It so happened when I was a senior in high school, a neighbor, a fellow that was in my class in high school, he had a sister that we were real good friends. So one day I went over to her house and he was there and he had a chess board out. And he said, you ever play chess? I said, no. He said, I'll show you how. He showed me the, the main, this is a rook, this is a this, queen, and da da da. They were, this, were, this one moves this way, this one that way. Okay, so it taught me. So anyway, that's about, uh, did I ever play a game after? Maybe, but so the fellow that was talking to me said, well, I said, well, I just, I know how to, but I never really play. Oh, come on down, while you're waiting, sit down. So I sit down with him, a chessboard. I sit down here, and he sits there. He said, how about trying to game a chess? Now there was somebody sitting there next to him, and he was finishing up, he was finishing up his game, and he's looking at me. So it seems I made some wonderful move that I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew I moved a piece here, and then I moved a piece there. And it seems that I did something phenomenal. And then I made something very, because I didn't know what I was doing. I was moving the pieces that I knew how to move. And this fellow had a crew cut, and he came over and said, do you mind if I take your game? He says, you have a, I, I like the, what you started. Is it okay if I finish it? I said, go ahead. I said, because I'm going to wait for a bus anyway. It seems what I started out to do was some fantastic thing, which I didn't have any idea. And he said, where are you taking a bus to? And I explained. He said, let me finish the game. I'll take you there. And that's how I met him. So. I was dating somebody else. I was dating somebody from the school. That's another story. But at any rate, he said, can I take you? Now, remember I said, you can't date the boys. You can go to the dances, but you know, of course all the girls did. But if it was somebody else that came to the door, you could go out with that person which I did, and that's how I met him, playing chess. So, yes, and like I told you, Robert Frost, when I saw that, I cut it out. How long were you married? Um, about 30 years, something like that. 
So, he ended up marry, marrying his receptionist. You know the Holiday Inn? Mm -hmm. So, one of the waitresses who knew me, as a matter of fact, he was a patient. And that's where he had his reception. So she tells me this, that he was getting up, he got, got up, he was making a toast to his wife. And I'm not just saying to but she really wasn't beautiful. But at any rate, she was standing there with a the coffee pot. And then he sits down, and she said it was all that she could do to hold back from pouring the coffee on his head. Anyway, right. So the things that I've accomplished, I think I was the first woman to get the Presidential Medal of Honor. It's over there. It's from all over the United States. And then, I'll show you those pictures. Mm -hmm. And then, 25 years later, I was asked to go back. They were having, um, it was a reunion, and they were honoring the past people who've had that honor. Pennsylvania Optometrist of the Year. I was asked, they had something at the University of UPJ. I don't know if it still exists. They asked somebody from every profession, a dentist, a this, a that, an optometrist. They asked me. And over the years, oh, over the years, I had, I don't know, 30s, what, what that was, I would go up to begin with and give a speech about my profession, what all I did, and then if any kid thought, oh, I think I'd like to do this, you took them into your office for so many hours for three months. And then, if they wanted to go to college for that, you sponsor them. So, along the way I had some wonderful students. The first one that came in, John, John Bosha from Eastern Pennsylvania, who has a fantastic practice today. But my office, I started off my office with my dad's office. And then it was bought out by somebody. So the building. So there was, I didn't want to go in the upstairs. Oh, I think I'll, why not have your own place? Gussie? Anyway, there was a house, the woman made hats on Lincoln Street. And that house was up for sale. I bought the house, knocked it down, built an office. Built an office in 73. Saw the whole thing washed away in 77. And I did not have insurance. So at the Holiday Inn, they cleaned up that one big room and they had, no, there was no electricity or anything. They had a cart with, um, that you could have coffee. 
and it was with oil, I can't remember again. What to use for a flame, or for heat? Uh, Kerosene? Hmm? No. But something like that. Mm -hmm. At any rate, then they had paper cups. So I went to my accountant and wrote down, he prepared a paper for me. And I met with one of the agents. And he's going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, marking off, marking off. We can start you off with $100,000. My coffee cup is here, <coughs> and the coffee pot is on the, the coffee cup is on the floor. I spotted it, I excuse me, I was, oh my God, I can't. We can do this, we can do that. You can pay well, 3%. There are a lot of other people asking for these. So, now I have to rebuild. And everything, the instruments, The chair, the refractor, all gone. So my son was in Philadelphia. My son became an optometrist. You can see my son over there. But at any rate, I'll show you later. He was on the subway in Philadelphia. And he looks over, some man was reading a paper. And Jonathan's looking over at the paper. And it says, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, underwater, or so forth. Oh, he, <laughs> he called me. So he came home. And of course, I had people working, including Jonathan. Jonathan took an axe into the wall and the water came out because the hole in sides mm -hmm. had to be and it had to redo had to redo it. It didn't have didn't have it flood insurance. Did you rebuild in the same place? Yeah. Okay. We built in the same place. I'll show you a picture later. Do you know where Penn Furniture was? Yes. My office was right next to the pen furniture. And then there was the barber shop. And then there was the alley that went from Lincoln Street down to Main Street. Yeah, I have a picture somewhere of me at that time. <laughs> and um, and had to get everything. It was all gone. But I rebuilt. And when I rebuilt, a friend of mine, her husband from school, we weren't close friends. And uh, her her son was an architect. And we had talked to reunions and whatnot. I, I called them. And um, he rebuilt. But, you know, the refracting room, like this big wasn't insulated. So somebody, I had two refraction rooms. And one, it was impossible. If somebody was the other, you could hear. It wasn't right. So I had to redo that. Oh my God. That, um, there was an Amish 
uh, contractors, and I was given the name. And I said, can you work at night so I could still work? Can you work starting at 5 o'clock? And they did that, 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock, until they finished. But they had to redo the walls. But when they first came in, they were wearing light brown clothes with an apron. So I called up somebody and I said, I feel like, there goes the, can't come up with the name. The elves, oh, who's the girl? Anyway, I felt like her. Like the elves, I can't think of who that. Are you thinking like Snow White with the seven dwarfs? Right, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. See, when I'm under a little bit of pressure, I can't come up. I call somebody, that's why I said, I feel like Snow White with the seven dwarfs. Lordy, lordy. And they fixed the place up. They did a fantastic job. Time, oh, and then I had Birkebaugh brothers, for real builders. They added on, it made it big, bigger in the back, and I had a private office. But they built a whole new section. And I shared the, um, The back the parking lot with the people from Penn Furniture. There's one big so now I'll jump back. Remember I said about <clears throat> having the students? Mm -hmm. So the first one his name is Dr. John Bosha. I'll show you his picture. He was the first one I was getting from UPJ. So I said, you'll come down, I'll show you what goes on here. You'll come down on Thursday afternoon. The office was closed. But they, I had something I, for um, safety's sake that you put a combination on the door, and you don't touch that till the next morning or an alarm goes off. So I said, you can't come in the front door. I'll be in my office. There's a back door. Grab cheese, grab three times, and I'll let you in. So Thursday afternoon, well, a little bit after lunch, I'm waiting and knock, knock, knock. And I open the door. And I said, he comes in and I said, and what shall I do with you? And do you know what that's from? What shall I do with you? Well, there's a book, Dick Oliver Twist. Uh -huh. So Oliver Twist, did you see the movie? Yes. Okay, do you remember when Oliver Twist, he's working in the factory or whatever, and now he's going to escape and go to see Aunt Betsy? Yes. And the man drives off with all his belongings, so now he has to walk. By the time he gets to Aunt Betsy, he's raggedy. Yes. <laughs> I like the patient I used to, used to say raggedy. Anyway, he was <laughs> raggedy and dirty, and he finally had Bessie's out clipping the flowers, and he goes up, and you're my Aunt Betsy, because I'm thinking, see. and he throws his arms around this little boy, and rather, rather, this little boy throws his arms around her legs. At that point, at the house, there's a man looking out the window, and he's 
okay, but he's not quite all there. But anyway, she looks up at him and she said, and what shall we do with him? And he looks down and he says, wash him. So with that background, when John Bosha came in, I said, and what shall I do with you? And to this day, he keeps in, not only keeps in touch, but is wonderful, wonderful. There are three students, I'll show you their pictures, who are like my own children. So that was part of the practice that I, that I enjoyed. And, and I enjoyed other, other things because it wasn't only examine the eye, here's the prescription out. If there were special needs, I'd have to know what do you, what kind of work do you do? Or if there were special needs otherwise, I thought, what can I do to help? And that's why I, I had a practice. I can remember when they did a lot of housing and they, one of the places they had was torn down and then they had other housing, I think it was on Lincoln Street, I'm not sure, but ever. At any rate, that was Lincoln Street. This woman came in, she was up in years and she had been part of that housing that they were doing away with. But she was still there, but not for long. And the new had a list of people because not only the people from there, but other people were going to the housing that still exists today. She didn't speak English very well. And we were, we were talking and she said, that she didn't, her name is on the list, but she's not quite sure, excuse me, what she's going to do if her name isn't. So I excused myself from her, went out of the room, and I called somebody. Her name came next to the top. Huh. And there are other things. How long did you practice? How long were, were you actively practicing? Over 50 years. Um, remember I said about getting students? Mm -hmm. Well, I also, I was a mentor for the college. A student wanted to do a um, term with me. You work for an optometrist, you could work in a hospital, any other place. And um, I took in a, uh, from all of the ones that I saw, and one of them became, worked with me. So, I'm thinking nineteen ninety five, something like that. It's over fifty years. Mm -hmm. But but I'm saying Did you ever teach? Did you ever teach any optometry classes in a college? Pardon me? Did you ever teach? any optometry classes at a college level? No, but I, on um, reunions and whatnot, I was always, always part of it. And I loved what I did. 
What kept you in Johnstown? You traveled all over the world. You could have been anywhere. What kept you here? The practice. It's one reason why. Why did I ever get married again or so forth? I couldn't leave Johnstown. Hmm. My practice. But uh, I look back. Oh my, I'm going to be 103. When is your birthday? May 26th. Oh, it's coming up. I'll be 103. Congratulations. I never thought I would end up here. But when I passed out, covered with blood, and not quite there. I had been having a late breakfast on a Saturday. And I thought, I'm going to go put some things in the washer. By the time I'm finished, I can put them in the dryer. That'll be fine. Now, my house is all steps. There's a step up to get into, shall I call it a sub first floor. Then there's, if you go up through the front door, three steps up to the living room. Let's go back down to the sub first floor. Keep on going this way, three steps up to the kitchen. So I went three steps down to get on that, into the laundry room. And coming out of the laundry room, I passed out. Mm -hmm. Covered with blood, not barely, barely there knowing what I'm doing. I know I need help. Now I was told after the first fall, when I went back to my doctor, that it was remarkable I didn't break my neck. But he said you've got to use a that's, you've got to use a walker, and you have to wear mentor. So anyway, I didn't have a walker with me. I didn't have a mentor on, and I bumped myself. a little bit longer than this distance, over to where there was a telephone on a desk. I couldn't reach it. I pulled it, the wires and got the telephone and called 911. And I said, my doctors are at Wimber. They said, you'll never make it. He said, we're going to the trauma center. I had a living will. Now, after reading a book about doctors who give people up in years all kind of medicine and they live in agony, isn't it better just to peacefully go? Or worse yet, surgery, isn't it better just to peacefully go? So now I'm in the, the trauma. Center, under gurney, and I had a living will, and I didn't know that when you go to a hospital, you could just push a button, and your whole history is right there for every any doctor or whatever. Anyway, I heard the word resuscitation. I heard it again. I said, "Am I going to die?" No answer. Am I going to die? No answer. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. I said, I don't want to die. And that's the last thing I remember. They put on a pacemaker. And at this point, <coughs> 
I can't use this. That's another story. I can't use this left arm. Well, wonderful. Outside of that, <coughs> at my house, I had a narrow shower. I could I could have gone home, except I can't go home because somebody else is living in it. It's been sold. I have one and a half lots. My patio this time of the year and on. <coughs> but it's gone. So I'm here. <coughs> You've lived a remarkable life. And let me show you. Okay.